Good morning to all of you in Sydney. Um, I'm joining you live from Boston, where my duties here at Harvard Business School have prevented me from making the trip, but uh, I wish I could be there. Uh, and I'm grateful that modern technology makes it possible to have this session and have a great discussion despite the distance. Uh, I want to start by thanking and congratulating Peter Yates and Helen Steele of the Shared Value Project for their remarkable leadership in building this movement in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, thanks also for inviting me to speak to you today. Uh, what the Shared Value Project has accomplished already uh, in creating a regional shared value community, including so many of you business leaders and nonprofits and government leaders, is truly impressive. Uh, I also want to recognize uh, IAG and NAB for their leadership uh, of the movement from the corporate side, uh, making uh, their, the success and the support of this effort uh, has been indispensable to where we are today. And, uh, uh, you know, you are right now in the global epicenter of shared value. Uh, there's really no place in the world where we have the energy the, and, the, and the concept and the clarity and, and the direction and the motivation to move this forward. So hopefully we can continue to uh, lead the world uh, in the Asia Pacific region and uh, uh, and uh, I very much uh, am just honored to be part of this. And, and to, in addition, I want to add my thanks to AIA Australia, PwC Australia, Edelman, for their indispensable support for this particular summit. Um, and so all, to all of you, either I've mentioned or who I haven't mentioned yet, we're grateful for your partnership in this movement. And without this, uh, the whole shared value movement would not be where it is today. So thank you for that. What I would tell you is we are at a very, very, very interesting moment now in the whole uh, topic of social impact. This has been a germinating topic for many, many years in the business community. Uh, there's been a wide variety of words and phrases and concepts and approaches in this area. In conscious capitalism, circular economy, double bottom line, uh, and more and more and more. In fact, I would tell you that there's still a lot of lack of clarity about how to think about this question of what's the role of business in actually advancing society. Um, and uh, the idea of, of purpose is, 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 has come on the scene and is a very powerful new injection of energy. In fact, I think at this particular moment, there's so much more energy on this topic than I've ever seen uh, since I've been working in the field, that I think we have an opportunity for a, truly an inflection point in this entire endeavor of having business play a powerful role, not just in, in a narrow economic sense, but also in advancing society as a whole. But if we're going to do that, we're going to have to improve the, the practice in this field. We've got to get beyond the confusion of words, We've got to not use 25 different words to say the same thing. We've got to get clarity and we've got to get rigor and we've got to end the confusion uh, about what purpose is, what shared value is and what we in, in business need to do. So where is this real takeoff, this liftoff of uh, business thinking about social impact? Where is it coming from? And I think uh, some of you have already mentioned that. Uh, I think it all starts with the fact that the, the, of the age we're living in and the awareness we have uh, during this period of history about all the major significant social, environmental, economic development challenges we face. They're just everywhere. And the uniqueness about this period of history is that we're so aware of them. And uh, uh, everybody is aware of them. My kids are aware of them. Their kids are aware of them. Uh, it's, it's, it's the awareness of these problems, I think, is the fundamental energizer that something more needed to be done. We couldn't rest on the traditional institutions here. Uh, government and NGOs do the Lord's work. Uh, they make a very much positive impact, but these institutions are not designed to have the resources and the capabilities themselves to fully meet these challenges. They can't raise enough money, they can't raise enough taxes to really deal with all these problems. A business is the only institution that has the resources, that has the capabilities, that has the expertise to actually meet needs, social needs at scale. Uh, and do that while simultaneously creating income and wealth and prosperity. It's the ability to make an impact 
uh, on society uh, while uh, uh, making, uh, being prosperous and creating income at the same time. That is the magic of capitalism. Capitalism is, is, is under attack uh, all around the world, but capitalism is the only institution in society that can actually take the, what, this on, the circumstances we are in in the world. Uh, you know, but yet uh, capitalism is uh, in America uh, is uh, being uh, severely criticized in many respects. Uh, for example, only 45% of Americans between 18 and 29 view capitalism as a positive, uh, and they tend to prefer socialism. Uh, and all of us who have you know, been out there in this world for the last 15 or 20 years, it, it's horrifying because what we know is socialism never works. We need to mar marshal and uh, the ability of capitalism and business to actually tackle these issues. Government and NGOs alone simply can't do it. So uh, as a result of this kind of historical process and this learning that we've all been going through and the, uh, the sustainable development goals that are now prominently understood by many, many citizens, uh, you know, because of this evolution, company engagement in social issues is growing exponentially at this moment. And of course, the irony is that despite the fact that businesses are moving very aggressively uh, towards engagement in social issues, the legitimacy of business and of capitalism itself is actually declining now. Despite this enormous work that you are doing and so many other companies are doing, we still haven't broken through. We still haven't uh, managed to get broader society to understand how to think about the real solutions to our societal issues uh, and not view business as the problem, but one of the critical solutions. Uh, uh, we also have this enormous problem about the word profit. Profit is, for many people, a dirty word. Uh, it's seen as taking away resources from society somehow. But what we all know uh, in the shared value movement is profit is the enabler of impact. It's the enabler of scaling. It's the enabler of having the resources that allow you to meet societal needs. So we have got to simply uh, take this new thinking, this shared value thinking, which is still nowhere near universal in this world, and drive it and expand it and, uh, and, and, and market it and, and, and uh, you know, be behind it around the world. And uh, one of the reasons I'm so excited about being here today with this group and this uh, shared value community uh, is that it's one of the most powerful groups of people in the world at doing this. So we need you to continue. We need you to do it more. We need you to do it better. And we need to work with you in, in trying to make this all uh, take place. Now, um, how, the big question that's still a confusion in the world is how should business be involved in social issues? Uh, I think many of you in this room, I think you have a clarity in your own mind about what the answer to that question is. But most people still don't. Uh, there's still a lot of confusion, a lot of phrases uh, that I mentioned earlier about different ways of thinking about that. And that is simply slowing us down. And, and it's, it's, it's reducing our ability to impact, uh, make impact. Now, the, the good news is that we've come a long way from where we started. Uh, this whole movement really started with the idea that um, uh, Milton Friedman's article, which talked about the fact that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits, full stop. That doing anything else was a misuse of shareholder money. And that reflected uh, the historical uh, view that uh, profit was good enough for society, that if we made profit, that meant we hired people, we invested capital, we paid taxes. But I think now we understand how really, how simplistic Friedman's thinking really was. Um, what Friedman failed to understand, and we have to be totally uh, comfortable talking about this to anybody, uh, including the financial community. Friedman failed to understand that social improvement was consistent with improving profits. Historically, economists thought it was inconsistent. Um, also, Friedman failed to understand that social conditions can actually constrain profit. And if we don't think about social conditions, we're not going to actually maximize the profit to the shareholders, which Friedman declared as the principal goal of business. Luckily, we've gone beyond that. But we're going through a process that has been evolving over a number of years, uh, and we're still in the evolution. 
Um, and although I think the people in this room are farther towards the end point than almost any place in the world I've encountered, uh, we still have enormous amounts of clarity and, and, uh, uh, and, and rigor that we have to bring to this discussion. So um, again, many of you have seen uh, some of the, me, me talk about some of the evolution of corporate social impact. Um, and of course, it all started with philanthropy. That was, that was the first thing, it was okay. You were allowed to give some money, uh, as long as it wasn't too much, and, uh, and to volunteer. And that, would, that became uh, uh, you know, an acceptable role of business. Uh, and that was, that, that was supported by uh, you know, not every investor, but certainly it was seen as a good thing. And uh, it is a good thing. Um, but uh, what we also know about philanthropy is and that we first that we should keep doing it and philanthropy still is alive and well corporate philanthropy it should continue to be alive and well but we need to use our philanthropy to the extent that we're doing that very very effectively and the problem we've had with philanthropy and it's part of the problem that we've had with corporate social impact in general is that powerful philanthropy is relatively rare that's because there's only so much we can do to give money uh, to volunteer our employees' time when we also need them to work in the business. We also find that philanthropy has been remarkably unfocused in most, most companies. Uh, you give a little money to lots of different causes and then wonder why they don't make a big impact. And the answer is we're not strategic about our philanthropy. We're not focused. We're not connecting it to our business. Does that sound familiar? Uh, that's what we've come to understand in the shared value movement. But philanthropy is, uh, is, 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 is a starting point. It's something we need to continue to do. We need to do it better and better. But as, as again, I've talked to many of you before, uh, we, we've gone beyond philanthropy. Um, and the, that, that was defined as corporate social responsibility some years ago. This is still ubiquitous. Everybody's doing it. Their CSR reports you know, come to my office every day. Uh, and CSR is different than philanthropy. It's about doing something uh, to you know, impact your uh, reputation, your license to operate, your trust in, uh, among customers and the communities. But the problem with corporate social responsibility is it's stuck on the idea of responsibility. That rather than think about impact or results, we think about compliance. We think about what do we have to do to kind of show that we're good people. Um, and, and corporate social responsibility, I think, got a lot of people on the bus, but it's not a bus that's picked up speed very rapidly. And the impact of most CSR efforts are limited. Why? Because they're unfocused. They're, uh, they're, they're not focused on impact. They're focused on lots of other good things like trust and reducing risk and, and, and building our reputation in the community. Uh, that, was, that was a step in the right direction. It was about doing things, not giving, uh, but ultimately it wasn't powerful either. Um, and it didn't make much of a difference in the social problems that we, um, that we face and continue to face. So where have we gone from social responsibility? What's been the next step or two or three? Well, uh, because of the intense pressure um, uh, and expectations of business's role have continued to grow, and I think that's a good thing because we want more and more of our citizens understanding business has a role here and they ought to have high standards and they need to push us. So we're starting to see a movement beyond uh, CSR and the most well-developed of those movements, unfortunately, is not yet shared value. Uh, that's, not, that's not yet, where the, the end state where we want to get is not yet the one where we are today. Uh, I think the next big movement was investor-driven social impact measurement. You know, all of you have heard of ESG indicators and GRI indicators. You know, investors facing some pressure and demand from their, uh, from their clients started trying to capture whether companies were good or, or, or doing good uh, uh, using uh, these ESG indicators, these GRI indicators. And this was an effort to create measurement and that measurement to create incentives for companies to actually raise the bar. And, uh, uh, and that's, that's a good concept. Uh, we believe deeply in the role of incentives. The trouble with these incentives is they're very, very imperfect. Uh, both ESG and GRI are about hundreds of different areas, dozens and dozens of areas of social impact. 
Um, there's a, uh, any company that wants to you know, do well on ESG or GRI has to be thinking about lots of different things, uh, whether those things are relevant to its business or not. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of self-reporting here as opposed to really uh, uh, independent verification and, and, and rigorous measurement. Net net, this has been a positive. And it's good to get investors into the game because investors have been the enemy. The investors have been the ones pushing away from social impact and towards kind of narrow definitions of corporate goals and, 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 and the need for profitability. So we've gotten the investors on board. But this particular model where investors just come up with some scoring systems and then they can rate companies on this, this is not proving to be a very powerful answer. Um, it's really not focused on improving innovation. It's not focused on really driving rapid progress in improving uh, the scores. It's, it's checking a box. It's uh, being able to validate, oh, yes, we're a good company because we do okay on ESG or, or GRI rankings. The, one of the big steps forward in the investor, uh, the investor measurement model world has been the materiality idea that was just mentioned. Key, there's so many indicators because there's so many social issues and so many social challenges that, that if, if you're not careful, you're going to end up with many things that don't really matter or even apply to the company given their business and uh, uh, what they do. Uh, but the materiality idea is starting to get the idea that for a given company, there's certain social impacts that are most important for that company to worry about, think about, and hopefully contribute to. So uh, uh, the materiality movement has been a step forward, but again, it doesn't get us to the end of the, the day. The day. It's, th this, this effort is still mostly about checking boxes, showing you're okay, uh, and it's an exercise that many companies go through uh, year after year, which has probably uh, brought more attention to boards of directors and to senior executives in the social impact area, but it, it, it in itself is not the answer to how do we do this. So uh, the next big chapter uh, we've already been talking about uh, in, in just what I heard a minute ago as we were uh, uh, getting ready for, for my presentation, and that is this whole issue of a corporate social purpose. Uh, this, is the, this is the latest word, the latest phrase, the latest concept, um, and I think it's a big, huge step forward. Uh, number one, because it came from the biggest of all investors, like Larry Fink, saying that this was critical to being a good company, a successful company that they wanted to invest in. You know, Larry Fink owns a little bit of every company in the world of any scale. So having a, uh, an investor like that really lay this idea out and define this idea has been tremendously powerful. And this is, in a sense, what's created the inflection point we see today about what companies are going to do and how they're going to uh, attack this. Uh, the problem is that there's no clear accepted definition of social purpose. It means everything to everybody, in, in a way. Uh, uh, we, it, it's very loose statements, very high-level statements. Uh, uh, let, me talk, let me give you some food company purpose statements. Uh, I'm not going to identify the company because I don't want to embarrass them, but one of them is, we produce real food that matters for life. That's our purpose. Or, or, or another one, uh, we feed human progress around the world. That's our purpose, okay? So I think what you see from those purpose statements and many others like them is that if we're not careful, purpose is just another distraction, another window dressing, another thing that makes us feel like we're doing something important, but we're really not. Um, and uh, what makes a purpose statement powerful is that it's directly connected to what the company does, to strategy, to the social impacts that the uh, company aspires to achieve. A purpose statement that's, that's, that doesn't encompass that core uh, intellectual uh, character is not going to matter. It's just going to be an excuse to do CSR in another, in another way. Uh, we can't let that happen. We've got to harness the, the, the tidal wave of interest and purpose to the best use. And uh, I think that is going to happen only if we actually do what everybody in the room in Australia right now that's listening to me thinks we ought to do, and that is creating shared value. What makes corporate purpose powerful comes from 
connecting it to creating shared value. In fact, I believe that we can define corporate purpose as creating shared value. If we've created shared value, we have a purpose. If we haven't, you know, we're, we're, going through, we're going through some process to please, you know, some outsiders to think that we're a good company. Um, uh, creating shared value is by far the greatest impact of any idea for social impact that we've ever had in this whole history. Um, it's much more powerful than philanthropy. It's much more powerful than CSR. It's much more powerful than the ESG and GRI measurement processes. It's much more powerful than, than social purpose can ever be because those are, are, are simply steps in the right direction, but they're actually not guiding us to how do we really make impact? Where do we really make impact? Uh, how do we make impact that's actually scalable, not just you know, the latest good thing that we, that we want to claim to do? Uh, we're now at, at that opportunity, I think, now that we've gotten to corporate purpose as a key idea, is to, t is to raise the bar yet again to what I think is the far biggest lever we have to actually do what we've set out to do, which is to help corporations really change society and go back to uh, being central to the view of communities and, and citizens to uh, you know, making a positive impact rather than viewed with suspicion for uh, undermining somehow the societies in, in which they're operating. Now, I think you all know the, shared value, the key shared value concepts, but I think it's very important for us to over and over again understand the underlying fundamentals that make shared value so powerful. The first thing we have to understand is that the history, including Milton Friedman, was that social impact is orthogonal or a trade-off to business impact and profitability. That's what he thought. Uh, he, was, he just didn't understand the reality of competing in, in, in business in any industry. He was at a very high theoretical level. But what we now know is there's not a trade-off between economic and social performance. There's a synergy between economic and social performance. Um, we also know, and I know all of you know this, that you know, social issues and social challenges you know, cr are, represent the greatest market opportunities in the world today, in virtually every industry. This is where the new in in innovation comes from. This is where the taking things further comes from. Um, we also understand that uh, social challenges and social problems and environmental impacts are not just bad, they actually create cost for companies. Uh, if, we don't, if we use too much water, if we use too much energy, shame on us. We're bad business people. Uh, and now we understand that the social impact is not floating out in the ether. The, the social impact is fundamental to the actual nitty-gritty business of making a profit. And we can either turn that to our advantage and leverage it and push it forward with the tremendous satisfaction we get from actually changing the community's circumstances in which we operate, or we can simply get tripped up in the same old uh, simplistic thinking. Milton Friedman thought that maximizing profits was distracted by thinking about social impacts. What we know is maximizing profits is really enabled by thinking about social impacts now that we've learned what we've learned today. And this is the journey that we're all on. Now what social uh, shared value does is it really provides the playbook for how we maximize social impact. And again, I realize that many of you in this room understand this at some level. But the, the, the fact that we have a playbook, the fact that we have a methodology, the fact that we have a, a way of approaching this in a rigorous way that's specific to each business is indispensable in, move, in this whole movement continuing to proceed. That didn't happen with CSR. That didn't happen with philanthropy. That didn't happen with even corporate social purpose. Uh, the shared value uh, toolkit is fundamental to making all of this work. We have, to, we have to make that last jump. If we can get business to creating shared value as the guiding concept for social impact, we're going to succeed. I until we do, we're going to have a lot of people doing good things and talking a, a good game, but they're not going to be impacting uh, what we really need to impact. 
Now, as you all know, uh, most of you know, there's really three sort of vectors for creating shared value. One has to do with products and customers served. Another has to do with the value chain, our operating model, how we utilize resources, energy, and so forth. And the third has to do with the ecosystem or the business environment in which a company operates. And the idea there is if a company is in a poorly constructed business environment, it's not going to be very competitive and very successful in delivering anything uh, important. What we learn from all of this work on shared value uh, in industry after industry is that at level one, we've been looking too narrowly at products. We've been looking too narrowly at needs. We've been looking uh, at target customers too narrowly. Shared value guides us to see whole new opportunities here uh, on the product side. Uh, we know that level two here uh, is telling us that we've been looking at operating efficiency too narrowly. We've missed a lot of critical drivers of operating uh, success uh, as we've overlooked energy uh, efficiency and, and climate and, and resource use and water use and all those things, which we typically ignored. Uh, and shared value also has made it clear that the most, the starting question for thinking about shared value uh, are twofold. There, there are two questions. Number one, as you see on the bottom of the slide, what social issues does my business touch? And the more I touch them, the more impact I can have. And then the second question is, what social conditions does my business depend on? So many companies just ignored or, or failed to understand that they're dependent on many social conditions. Uh, like, for example, uh, if, there's if there's no affordable housing in your community, and it's very hard to, to attract workers and to retain workers who you know, couldn't find a place to live and couldn't afford to live where they live, that's going to hurt the business. We need a good affordable housing, not for charitable reasons or to be good or to be an NGO. You know, we need that for being an effective, profitable business. And it, the shared value movement is so powerful because it's brought to light some of the most powerful drivers of business performance uh, you know, in the, in the, from, the, from, from an odd place. It, it's come from looking at social impact. It's not coming from, you know, traditional business as usual thinking. So we in this room have to continue to drive and illustrate and, uh, and, and demonstrate this thinking and its power and be willing to quantify it and talk about it uh, rather than uh, stay in the clouds uh, making platitude statements about, you know, how wonderful our company is. The very exhilarating thing about Australia and about this shared value uh, uh, movement you all have created in, in Asia is the tremendous world-class examples. So uh, again, you know all these examples, but we talk about these all over the world. We talk about these with great pride uh, every time we talk about shared value. NAB's program on uh, the assist program to recognize that you know if customers have financial distress and hardship, that's bad for business. It's not just a bad thing. It's not just something to be feel sorry about. Um, and NAB then has taken that on and said, if we can deal with that through better programs and better coaching and better support from our employees, uh, we're going to have a tremendous impact on, on financially distressed you know, uh, families. But we're also going to have a tremendously positive impact on our business. And you can see some of the uh, the, the metrics of success. And uh, uh, this is what shared value is all about. It's about the business. It's recognizing that where we have a problem with our customer, when our customer isn't doing well, it's our job to fix that, not blame the customer, which so many banks historically did. Uh, it was the customer's fault that if they overdrew an account and they, were, they, they should be penalized with fees. Uh, that's not the way to think about it. That's what we in the shared value movement understand. In many more examples, AIA Australia, this, this fusion between insurance and wellness, which at one level is completely obvious, but no insurance companies in the world understood the shared value it, until Discovery started out in South Africa and AIA and, and a number of others, not a lot, but have, have really figured this out. That insurance is fundamentally about uh, uh, avoiding uh, problems. And uh, in this particular case, if you can improve a customer's health, not only is that customer ecstatic, but you're lowering the cost of providing the insurance because the insurance is to pay for health problems. And this, this powerful insurance idea 
is a game changer in the entire industry. And this is where all insurance has to go. It can't be on underwriting anymore. That's a dead idea. That's a dinosaur. We have to take a shared value view of insurance, and AIA is. Uh, Uncle Toby's, you know the story. Uh, uh, you know, there it's about sourcing a major uh, uh, raw material, uh, uh, oats, which are critical to their uh, sourcing and their, and their product. And, and uh, the question is, how can we make the oats better? How can we make it, uh, you know, more efficiently produced? Um, and that's our job, because if we can get oats at higher quality, at lower cost, uh, and, and while the farmers that are producing that oats can make more money, then we're going to tr create a tremendous power to actually improve our business and, and make more money and reduce transportation costs. And uh, while at the same time as we're making our growers more prosperous, and therefore they're going to do a better job in, uh, in delivering uh, performance. Uh, you know, Carnival Australia uh, has understood that if, if they want to be successful as a uh, as a as a tourist tourist related uh, uh, organization uh, in, in terms of travel, uh, they've got to make sure that there's ri rich, vibrant tourism opportunities in every place they go, and they've taken the lead in trying to enable that through their work with indigenous entrepreneurs. And so there's more experiences that people that are on a Carnival cruise can take advantage of that shared value. It's tremendously powerful for all those communities that the tourists are going to visit. You know, here's a purpose statement that actually is the right kind of purpose statement. This is the IAG group. Uh, they, they, they settled on a purpose statement. Why do we exist? We make your world a safer place. Now, if you look at that at first brush, you can get to the idea of, oh, well, this is just another one of those windy purpose statements. But actually, what they realize is the fundamental shared value point is that the safer it is, the less things cost and the more value you can deliver to your customer. And they've done that in a variety of ways in both uh, auto travel, homes, safer homes, uh, resilience to national disa natural disasters. And they've created a win-win shared value opportunity for both them as a company and for their uh, customers. Now, you know, what's remarkable, truly remarkable, is that as we've rolled out the Fortune Change the World list, which we continue to believe is a major breakthrough in trying to turbocharge this movement on a global basis, you know, look at the uh, uh, Australian and Hong Kong shared value project members who have made that list. Uh, this is extraordinary. And this is what happens when you understand these ideas, uh, when you understand the, that this is, this is about rigor, this is about discipline, this is about strategy, this is about uh, really uh, economics. Uh, look at what you can achieve. And uh, I just want to tell all of you and just uh, ask, ask you to consider that Fortune is right now soliciting nominations for the 219, 2019 Change the World list. If you're on the shared value game, apply. Uh, what they're going to look for is what are you doing to create measurable social impact and how much are you creating? How, how much is it affecting your business results? What's the degree of innovation involved in, in the social impact you're having? How integral is shared value to your overall strategy? I'd like to see five or 10 more Asia Pacific uh, Australian, you know, Korean companies on this list. You are setting the standard for the rest of the world, and eventually the rest of the world is going to figure out that this is what they need to do. But we're not quite there yet. We're still confused. We still haven't gone the last mile to social impact and business, but we can. And the people sitting in this room right now are the ones who are going to help us get there. So just to, in conclusion, uh, I believe the purpose of business is to create economic value in a way that also creates shared value for society. It's doing those things together that are powerful. Uh, our greatest impact on society is going to be by acting as a business, not as a giver, not as a good guy or a good, good girl. Uh, and we all understand that. <clears throat> that. This is why I believe that actually purpose is creating shared value. If your purpose statement isn't about how you're creating shared value, it's not powerful. It's not going to matter. And I think that uh, we, we have a real opportunity here uh, to finally uh, have liftoff in shared value thinking and also the impact of business on society and hopefully uh, over time the view of business by our, 
our fellow citizens uh, if we can comp keep this momentum moving. So let me stop there. Uh, we have some time for Q&A. I'd look, f uh, look, look forward to any of your questions. Make them as hard as possible. And uh, uh, let's, let's use this time to kind of carry on this discussion. And if anybody has struggles or issues that they're facing, please raise them. Uh, because I think only by you know, serious conversation in a group like this will we, we'll be able to really uh, uh, make this truly an inflection point. So thank you, and, and let's open it up. So thank you, Michael. It's Catherine Carver here. I'm the Global Head of Corporate and Institutional Relationships at National Australia Bank. I think that's called a call to action in terms of questions, but I'm going to kick off. Uh, so I'll just ask a couple of questions and then open it up to the floor. So let me just kick off, Michael. Um, first question, purpose-led companies should be willing to make difficult choices even at the expense of short-term risk to revenues. How does the board, in your view, retain shareholder confidence when taking purpose-led risks that impact profitability in the short term? It's a question close to my heart. Well, I think uh, any smart board uh, in the future is going to le learn that you have to take those kind of risks if you're going to be truly a successful company. Uh, because the big opportunities for improving company performance, growing, growing the top line, growing the bottom line, uh, you know, globalizing and serving new markets, all of those innovations are going to be fundamentally emerging from this kind of thinking. And uh, so boards have to catch up. Um, and, uh, you know, it's happening. Uh, also, investors uh, still haven't quite gotten there. They still see this as something to, is, they see it as window dressing. Uh, they see, uh, you know, ESG scores as, oh, if we just put out good scores, then we'll look good, and therefore investors will say, okay, it's okay to invest in these guys. What we need to have investors understand is actually shared value thinking is the most powerful tool for driving innovation, growth, and profitability. And uh, so uh, I think the biggest uh, entity now, the biggest constituency we have to really tackle is investors. And investors are still, uh, they're, they're, they're leaning in the right direction, they're moving in the right direction, but investors are still actually a problem because if investors were doing their job, they would understand that a company on the track to kind of invest in the short run in, in, in this shared value initiative that makes sense, that's the company to invest in, not the company that's just doing the same old stuff over and over again and just in, in stripping out cost to try to make their performance look better. So, um, you know, uh, the investment community has been resistant. I think it starts with Milton Friedman. Uh, but I think at least it's moved to measuring shared value. At least the leader, leading investors are talking about uh, purpose now, corporate social purpose as something good. Uh, I wish they would stress more that corporate social purpose is also about corporate profit. It's not about being, being good and being loved. Okay, so uh, that would be my, uh, my quick answer. We, we still haven't conquered the investment community. I think we're doing a much better job with the business community than we are with the investment community. And I would also say that many of us in business are making the problem worse because we're not talking about the economic benefits, we're just talking about our social benefits. We like to talk about that, and then we feel guilty if we're going to talk about the economic benefits that we're gaining by making this tremendous social impact. We've got to get over that, uh, but that's been a tough one for companies to deal with because they're so used to getting beaten up by NGOs for you know, making too much money. Uh, and uh, that, you know, the, the legitimacy of, 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 of social impact, if, if, if you make a profit to achieve it, is, is somehow undermined or, or, or reduced. So I think uh, those would be my uh, uh, high-level comments on this issue. We have a ways to go still. Okay, thank you. Uh, just another quick question from me and then I'll open to the floor. Uh, given the long-term nature of purpose and shared value, how do organizations effectively allow their strategy to mature without being impacted by restructures or changes in leadership? Well, I think uh, what I would tell you is that I don't think that shared value strategies are any longer term than good strategies in general. I mean, you look at the great companies that built incredible success, you know, Google and you know, Tesla and whoever, it, it was a long-term game. And they, their ability to drive that long-term innovation game 
was what ultimately allowed them to, uh, you know, rise above that and, and be perceived as, uh, you know, a great company. Uh, so I think that shared value does sometimes require, you know, gestation. Uh, but I think that in business innovation, pure business innovation, also requires gestation. And we can't feel sorry for ourselves and think that's some kind of a difference. I, th I think it's good leadership is, can look, look at the, uh, the opportunity, at the fundamental economics of the opportunity, and not get hung up on, oh, this is taking too long. Uh, You've got to make the taking it too long part of describing you know, what you're actually doing and why it's going to have a payoff. So uh, uh, I, I, you know, I think it's, uh, the long-term thing is a bit of a cop-out, I believe. All great businesses have a long-term view. Uh, to get to where they are. Now, once they're, once they're successful, then they can take a short-term view and get away with it. But uh, I think all, all really great companies in this world have had a long-term view. That's how they got there. A question from the floor, uh, Michael. Is it time to consider regulatory responses to counterbalance the continuing endurance of the profits first shareholder primacy mindset? Uh, I don't think that you know regulation would have any impact on that. Really, I think you could try, but you, you try to think about how you would do that, how you would structure the regulation. And uh, my think, my 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 view is is that the the only the the the, the thing that's going to change that uh, is investors. Uh, and again, investors are not yet understanding what really creates successful companies, like the ones we talked about a minute ago. Uh, and we see all over the world uh, that are changing the game, that are transforming their industry, that are redefining their their unique value proposition. Uh, so I think I think regulation is is a blunt instrument. I mean, I, I just, I'm reminded of India. You know, India wants to have companies, uh, you know, uh, have social impact. But th what they did was they said you have to uh, you have to spend so much money on social factors or you get penalized. And you know, that's not a way to really motivate the kind of innovation and thinking that we've been talking about that, has under, under, that, that underpins the shared value concept. So I think there's, uh, uh, governments have a hard time. This is subtle, complicated stuff. It's very hard for governments to regulate even simple things. But the idea that you could create a set of regulations that would work against what you talked about, I, I, I frankly don't think we have figured out how to do that. So I think we ought to go after the business leadership in this world, which I think we're doing through en entities like the shared value organization that you guys have been driving for uh, so many years. Uh, and I think we need to go after the investors and, uh, and we, have to, we can't be shy. We have to talk, about, to talk to investors about why this matters. We can't think that they'll get it you know, without explaining it to them, without taking it to them. We've got to be much more forceful about our reporting of this kind of activity. And eventually, investors are profit-seeking. They're going to figure out that great companies that do well think this way. And uh, they'll, this will be, be part of ordinary investment analysis. But I think a regulatory solution here would be very, very hard. And uh, again, remember, we used to regulate environmental impact. We used, to, we used to penalize companies based on admissions or things like that. And what we now understand is that you know, the companies were penalizing themselves through emissions and environmental you know, poor performance. You know, Vanguard, uh, Vanguard, no, uh, Walmart has saved $2 billion a year thinking about how to move its trucks more efficiently around to save energy. And we used to have the idea that we had to, you know, we had to regulate energy use or something like that. And, and, and of course, what we have to do is get companies to understand that energy use is, is dumb if you're using one, you know, tiny bit of energy beyond what you really have to, to, to get your job done in your company. So I, I'm a little skeptical of regulation in this area, but you know, I'm open to, to hearing some good ideas, but I, I'm not aware of any yet. No, I couldn't agree more. But one last question from the floor, just because uh, we are running out of time. And um, part of the issue with trust with business comes down to the extreme wealth of some business people. How do you think individual people and their personal goals can impact or build from shared value in business? Well, I think uh, what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, 
shared value uh, and business activity is one of the ways we're starting to bring more opportunity to lower income citizens, better housing, better health care, um, you know, better health uh, in, in ways that some of the examples I showed earlier are, uh, are, are illustrating and, and, and empowering. Um, I think, uh, uh, however, in the area of, of, of dealing with that, the, those many people in our societies that are not enjoying the, the same opportunity uh, that we, we, many of us enjoy, uh, and we have a big problem in the United States because there's a lot of people in this country, despite the fact that we supposedly have really low unemployment, they're not doing very well. Uh, the shared value movement has, has started to put its, its, its shoulder behind that issue. We have more and more banks looking for the underserved. We have more and more uh, examples like, uh, uh, you know, a bank working to avoid financial distress rather than viewing financial distress as a way to make money. So we, we've, got, we've got a head of steam now uh, in many industries that are starting to target on those people in our societies that are not enjoying the same opportunity and, and prosperity that the rest of us are. Uh, but I also think we have a really huge issue in the world about our political systems and the failure of our governments and our legislators and uh, uh, our other elected officials of actually tackling these real problems. Uh, instead, um, uh, you know, we, 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 we let them fester. Uh, we have issues of uh, discrimination that we don't take on. Uh, we have issues of health access that we don't take on. Uh, we have issues uh, of you know, lack of clean water uh, that we don't take on. And I think right now, my biggest fear in the world is really the failure of governments to actually move the ball forward, to do what government needs to do, to put in place policies and programs that really work because they take into account the needs of all of our citizens. They're not just done for the rich or the you know, biggest companies. They're, they're done to really give everybody an opportunity, which is, of course, one of the great bedrocks of the United States of America in our history, but we're failing today uh, to do that. So, uh, uh, you know, I just, just this is a, a bit of a sidebar, but, you know, my work today, uh, uh, and it's with a co-author named Catherine Gale, is heavily focused on politics in America. Because I think that politics in America is the biggest problem we face. We can't get things done that we know we have to need to do. Uh, because politics is, is blocking us and, and, and not allowing us to compromise and, and, and put together you know, the needs of all citizens as, as we set policy. So uh, I, I'm very hesitant not to get started on that because we take all the time for the whole conference, if, if you let me. <laughs> well, on that auspicious note, um, thank you so much on behalf of everyone at the Shared Value Summit for 2019. Michael, we've really enjoyed uh, your con the conversation you've had with us. And obviously, thank you to everyone for um, their questions. On behalf of everyone, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. My pleasure.